enjoy the same thing. <laughs> Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. On my right, of course, is Hawkeye. We welcome him back Hi. on the program <laughs> right there. And on the left is a guest I'm not sure we've had here in the studio before, although she's been with us fr uh, frequently online, and you'll see her. She does a great job, Erin Corvo. Erin is the associate, or de no, deputy health mm -hmm. officer for Wyandotte County. And joining us from Studio B is the uh, health officer for Wyandotte County, uh, Dr. Alan Greiner. These two folks have been a dynamic duo helping Wyandotte County navigate their way through this mm -hmm. health crisis and through the pandemic. Just a hats off to our family medicine department who continues to do great work across the state. So many of their faculty are involved as health officers in different county. Joseph Lamaster is in Johnson County. He's been on our program before as well. And there are multiple places throughout the county as well as with KDHE. So we really appreciate the strong work of our family medicine department. And then today we're especially hats off to Dr. Corvo and to Dr. Greiner for the great work they do as that dynamic duo here in Wyandotte County. So we're going to turn to them for a little for, in just a moment about what's going on there. And I'm sure we're going to probably hear a few questions about schools and reopening and the county and the reopening and what we're going to do. But Dr. Yeah. Hawkeye, Hi. how are we doing today? Uh, we're okay. We're, we're better than we were. So we had kind of recently in the past week peaked at like 36. Today we have 33 in the hospital. Yay! So that is good. Still six on the ventilator. We understand that once you go on a ventilator, if you have COVID-19, you're probably going to be on there for the most part yeah. for a while. So yeah, up to two weeks. Huh? We went from two to six patients on the ventilator. We've been at six patients on the ventilator for a while. Um, when we were talking about earlier, we do have 17 of the 33 patients in the ICU, so. But it's funny, because as we were also saying, um, yep. our ICU, we took one of our ICU units and there's got both um, floor patients and ICU patients in it. So some of those uh, COVID patients are actually floor status, but they're sitting yeah. in an ICU bed. So it, 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 it gets confusing and it has to do with how we try to make sure we have enough beds in the hospital. But yep. I think we're, it, it, it's 17, but it's not necessarily 70 people who are required to be in an ICU. It's just they're still Correct. in the ICU unit because we haven't transferred them yep. to the floor. And it should be important to note too, I am seeing a patient right now in the hospital Hospital who came from another facility. I think we need to continue to stress that the virus is out there. It is still spreading. Had no symptoms whatsoever. Again, could be early in the infection. We are continuing to monitor and um, always ask if, if, if you have new symptoms, let us know. So there is that going on as well. Hopefully they will be um, well, but that happened because we are testing everybody who comes into the hospital. And so we, we find these infections and then are able to really set them up for treatment moving forward and be proactive in that. Yeah, and, and I think that is key. And again, as we always try to reinforce to everybody, the rules of an infection control follow you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you are in a bar or a restaurant, a school, a hospital, or anything else. If you follow the rules of infection control, you can stay safe. And we've kept our staff safe by using gowns and, yeah. well, really masks and, really and goggles up on the floor mm -hmm. on COVID units. How many staff have gotten COVID from working on our floors. We're gonna say zero. And we are saying zero because yes. we believe that's the number. And it's just that's a testament to the simple rules of infection control. And remember, it's not a forever thing. It is a thing we should do right now. So Aaron, talk to us a little bit about Wyandotte County and how things are going and, and, and uh, how we're doing as far as the next few weeks and months you think that are coming down the pipe. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on and having Dr. Greiner uh, mm -hmm. on this morning. It's it's uh, been a, a busy time in, in Wyandotte County, as you can imagine. Um, we've continued to see uh, a number of cases uh, on any given day. You know, we've continued to keep open our um, our testing in, in the parking lot there. We're, we're currently open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, every day during the week, um, not weekends. <laughs> we need a little bit of a break. Um, you know, last week on uh, Monday, we, we peaked for the, uh, the sort of record uh, number of positive cases in a day, and we had, um, you know, over, uh, I believe, 130 cases that day, and so that was pretty pretty intense. Um, we've kind of um, gone back down a little bit. We're trying to get the, the word out about mask wearing. Um, mm -hmm. We continue to believe that that is an incredibly important part of, of what we do as a community and uh, are urging everybody to... Um, take heed of that uh, order in, in Wyandotte County. I think um, there are some really big looming questions in, in the community. We're uh, getting a lot of uh, questions, especially about school reopening, 
um, at this time, um, which I'm sure we'll we'll hit on today. I'm sure we will. Yeah, <laughs> the the big uh, question of the moment, um, and, and we can talk um, about how that's going to look uh, potentially in Wyandotte County. Um, I will say that we've seen um, some shifting kind of throughout this uh, pandemic. Um, we've been very interested in issues of, of equity and keeping our community safe. We have actually a tremendous amount of community spread. And you look at the number of cases in Wyandotte County and, and how large our, our community is. So we've got a, approximately 165,000 people in Wyandotte County and we're sitting at about 3,800 cases uh, right now. And, and first we were seeing um, you know, many um, people, unfortunately, in our African American uh, community, disproportionately affected, and um, now that's shifted, uh, we think, to our Latino uh, neighbors, mm -hmm. and we're very worried about that. So we're doing a, a lot of messaging uh, in, in Spanish and, and having meetings with our our health equity task force specifically around uh, that population. Well, we thank you for that work. We know that's sure. incredibly important, Alan. Yours from your standpoint uh, and what you're doing, and I know you work a lot with the county and with KDHE. How do you feel about where things are today? Alan, are you out there? Earth to Alan. All right. Well, while he's well, we try to make sure his his connection is secure. Let me ask you this, Aaron: the um, the, the shift from the African American to the Latino community in Wyandotte County. What do you think accounts for that? It's it's hard to say. We've actually um, had a, a number of meetings now um, with um, Latinx leaders in, in the community and uh, and folks who live in Wyandotte yeah. County and part of that community. And uh, you know, they say you know culturally, family is a really big deal. Um, there are important family gatherings. I mean, we've had a number of holidays now that um, you know folks have, have really wanted to get together, um, and and for good reason. I mean, that's how we. <laughs> you know, right. feel so feel so better so during yeah. this time, I think. Um, and, and so I, I think that there's been a lot of, like, family spread. Um, I think a lot of our um, Latinx community also are um, working in those essential um, workplaces where, where they're out and about and going to work and such. Um, and, and so we're just trying to drive home that message again of, of mask wearing, yeah. even when we're together yeah. with our families, if you're not in the same household all the time with those people. Um, and we all know, you know, I think we've talked about previously that we know a, a tremendous amount of spread in other countries. You know, we've, we've seen studies out of China where we're from family gatherings. So just trying to drive that message home. There's also yeah. a lot of fear out there, you know, about what this means when you're when you test positive. Um, we've gotten over some big hurdles, some trust hurdles, whereas we're seeing a lot of people come to us for testing. And so we're excited about that. Um, but I think also when somebody actually tests positive, those next steps are incredibly important. You know, how to isolate yourself when you're living in a big, big mm -hmm. household with, with many yeah. family members. Those next steps are, are really important. And I think to your point, um, all, any, of the, any essential workers, any workers can wear a mask. Right. If you want to add eye protection, you go to your local hardware store, Amazon, whatever, add eye protection. That's going to help even more and keep you safe in doing those tips. And, you know, I saw a patient who was 45 years old who, again, to your point about multi-generational, had a sister and a mother who was positive as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we're seeing it, I think, a lot in the families, just as you had talked about. Well, we are. And in fact, um, one of the folks who works here and is behind the scenes today, <laughs> Anthony, who does a great job. Hi, Anthony. Anthony uh, <laughs> was sick. His mom was sick. His sister was sick, all three that had COVID. And, uh, and then some folks in the fam household didn't get it. And we've had uh, Anthony on the show, and he's recovered well. Uh, but it took a while. I think I'm going to say, Anthony, about six or eight weeks, right, to really feel back to baseline. He's not and said, yep, yep, he, he was he was very mm -hmm. gracious to be on and, and uh, does a great job here with us. So I think Alan Griner's on. So, Alan, what's it look like? What do you see coming? And good morning. Sorry about Sorry that. that. Um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks, Dr. Corvo, for, for you, all your comments. I think, you know, I think we've we've gone through a rough month. I think we've we've all been real real stressed out about the way the data have, have gone. Um, but, but we are encouraged certainly by the fact that we've had less deaths than we would have, I think, expected at this point with the number of increased cases we've had in the, in the last four to five weeks. Um, and, and with the hospital numbers going up, um, we, as, as Dr. Corvo said, I think we are all super hopeful that that the mask compliance that I think is getting better and better every day is is going to stabilize things. We 
we see a slight trend in the last four or five days even of, of things flattening out. And, and we think if we can get even more people on board with, with mask wearing and the, and the other guidance that we've been giving, we can, we can really get back to where at least we have some hope that, that some of our strategies are working. Um, I, th I think that's what, what we'll be focusing on uh, as well as the school issues that, that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, it is encouraging. We're and, and obviously we're two weeks behind you because that's what happens with hospitalizations. Um, but we're encouraged that we went up and we have held steady mm -hmm. um, and we got our fingers crossed. The other thing we're encouraged by is much fewer deaths than we had early on. You know, I okay, I'm going to find some wood to knock on. Right there. <laughs> The uh, we have not had a death since June 27th, and and I know that's going to change. I mean, I say around COVID. I mean, patients die in hospitals, unfortunately. But 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 the um, but we've not had a death since June 27th, and that that's a stunning that's statistic to yeah. me. And we're, some folks are asking why is that, and and I think it's a combination of different things. First of all, it's a little younger population yeah. than we had that's initially. Uh, second of all, um, remdesivir, mm -hmm. steroids, and anticoagulation—they yep. do make a difference. Yeah. And uh, and we stopped using hydroxychloroquine. So mm -hmm. let's be honest, that may have been hurting patients, and not helping them. Too. Yep. And we've been doing convalescent plasma as yeah. well. So I think the, those those issues all probably combine to having yeah. a better outcome. And I think we've got some folks in the ICU right now that have been ventilated for a while. That may be a bit of a struggle, so we'll see. But nevertheless, it's been a lot better ride than it was initially around that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, doesn't mean you should take your masks off. It should mean you keep your mask on so you don't get in because we still have people on ventilators, we still have people sick, and this is not the flu. If I hear one more person <laughs> say to me, oh, this is just like the flu, I'm like, I may scream. <laughs> I guess I've been able to keep it calm pretty much. I can usually keep it together, but that phrase, either it's a hoax or this is just a flu, make me want to scream a little bit. Yeah, you, as a, as a know, doctor taking care of patients in the hospital, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. actually, I mean, I, I know you all have as mm -hmm. well, but um, it is striking yeah. how ill um, people people can get and and younger folks that you just wouldn't expect that you know with the traditional flu yeah, so. yeah. And, and if you are recovered that doesn't mean you can take your mask off either if you've survived covid that does right. not mean that you can take your mask off either so yeah and because there can be different strains of covid around we think we don't know the whole detail about that we don't even know how well our immunity lasts how long or how protective it is yeah. we think it is we, mm -hmm. we're hopeful <laughs> but we don't really know that yet for sure right yeah i think the biggest questions about immunity once you've recovered is how much and how long again we think and hope that you would have some immunity at least three six nine months and if you get exposed to it again you'll have either no symptoms or certainly much lighter symptoms but we don't know Hopefully now, as if we've kind of been going through this since March, essentially, we will start to get the, that data back and have more, more concrete answers for you. And I know that someone recently said mask growing had finally become patriotic, and I would say, well, I think it's always been patriotic. I think it's actually always been the right thing to do because mask wearing is for everyone next to you, right? That's who it's for, and, 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 and it's for yourself and for your loved ones, but you're really taking care of everyone. It's such a simple act to take care of everyone. Let's see if we have questions for media. I'm not hearing any there, mm -hmm. so that means we're going to open up to the to our listening audience, and I bet there's going to be questions at schools, et cetera. Let's see what's yeah. out there, Jill. First question, multiple people are asking, what is Wyandotte County recommending in schools about social distancing? Mm -hmm. uh, people are skeptical because schools, they think of them as crowded classrooms, crowded lunch rooms. What are the recommendations? So, Aaron, what do you think? Help us with that, because I know that's that's a question we've been hearing each of the last few days. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great question. We. We think that social distancing, um, you know, if we can get kids back in school, we think social distancing is going to be a really big part of, of how we need to run things. You know, we're, we're thinking at this point in time, if we continue sort of at the same rate of cases and such, that, that we will probably be able to open schools at about 50% um, is kind of what we're looking at. And, you know, in that 50%, we would really expect that, you know, at any given time, given a capacity of, you know, a room or a building itself or whatnot, that, that we would be spread out, um, you know, with that six-foot distance in, in between each kid. The other thing I want to emphasize, uh, again, is, is we are going to absolutely require mask wearing in the schools, um, uh, even for our, our little kids. And so I want to encourage parents, uh, even right now, I know 
kids are squirmy and they you know want to touch their faces and everything else um, but but start now with your children and, and help them um, sort of practice mask wearing um, throughout the day and, and when you leave your home so so we'll absolutely uh, require that for the teachers and and for the students as well Alan, what about, um, we have the mask wearing and things, but Wyandotte County is not a rich county by any means. Will the children who are at home still be able to learn on through um, uh, internet or Zoom, or how, how, how's that going to work? Yeah, they will, and I think we will see some families that, that opt, even if we're able to do, as, as Dr. Corville mentioned, and space kids out, I think there will be families that opt to have their kids do virtual learning at home, and, and that's fine. There Actually, there are quite a few supports in Wyandotte County. Um, some of the school districts there have really been innovators in, in technology. Um, you know, you remember that back when Google Fiber first came to Kansas City, they, they made their announcement over at, at Wyandotte High School in, in Kansas City, Kansas. And, and so they've done a lot of innovative things over the years that I think can be leveraged in now to really help kids that you know there are going to be families that struggle so i think the schools are are trying hard to come up with with all the supports and and mechanisms they can to to help families that that are that are going to face technological issues but but i, I think i think there'll be lots of lots of things we all learn out of this and and hopefully we can we can keep it all going and and that that it can be affordable i think i think we'll find ways Okay, good news, for, I think, for Wyandotte County yeah. families because mm -hmm. clearly you want to keep them safe and clearly you want people to learn, but you also have to be able to do that if you don't have, you know, the financial resources to have broadband in your home. So sure. that's sure. got to be a, a big struggle. Jill, next question. Um, they want you to clarify on half or 50% go to school. <laughs> is it half, you know, are they going to half a week <laughs> every so, other so day? So what you're asking is how do we structure it? How yeah. are you going to do that? How, yeah. What's the recommendation? You know, um, we're actually going to have each of the school districts submit plans to us um, with this idea of 50%. And again, it's more of a 50% capacity uh, of bodies in a space at any given time is sort of the, the big issue. Um, and, and so, uh, again, to practice that social distancing and such. So some schools, our, our, our superintendents have, have talked to us about, you know, bringing back the little kids, um, you know, our elementary age students. Uh, for everyday school and socially distancing them, but having, for instance, the high schoolers uh, be educated at home uh, because they, they are kind of more able to um, uh, do their own thing, you know, on, online. Um, that's certainly an option, but others have come up with other ideas, you know, having different cohorts, you know, the A group, the B group, bringing students back day in and day out. Um, one day on, one day off, that sort of thing. So again, um, we're going to be having more direction and possibly even an order come out um, Friday or Monday. And so please stay tuned. There's going to be a lot coming out on the YCOKCK.com uh, uh, website um, for, for the community. So Alan, one of some of the stuff has been out there and talking about children who are of elementary age or nine and under, 10 and under may not really be vectors or spread the disease as much. Has that figured into your thinking at all? I think it has. I think, um, we, of course, we're, we're hopeful to get even more data on that issue in the coming days because it would be nice to know that, that different age groups of kids are, are less likely to spread amongst themselves. Um, but, yeah, and, and we, I do think, as, as Dr. Corvo mentioned, we think that, that if, if that's true and, and we can have the younger kids doing cohort-style classes where they're, they're always together with the same group of kids and always with the same teacher, that makes a big difference because then we think we can, if we do get a case that pops up, you can figure out who, you know, who was around that case, and it's a lot less people that were around that case. So, so we will probably have, have significantly different recommendations about about the younger grade groups of kids than we will with the older groups but but we'll work with the schools we want them to be able to tailor it to, to how their facilities look and you know what their staffing capacities are and all that stuff so i think there's multiple ways people can achieve this idea of of basically having 50 percent less density of people than than what you previously had that's kind of the overarching idea is like if you take a a school space, how can you figure it out so that the density of the bodies is 50% is less? There may be as many bodies in that building, but if you can spread them out into, into gyms and auditoriums and common spaces that you previously didn't use for education, then you can achieve that social distancing. 
Hey, Dana, yeah. you know, I remember we've been talking to the folks from Children's and we've looked at this pediatric mm -hmm. data, but remind our audience, why would children who are of a younger age, 10 and under, mm -hmm. be less likely to spread the virus? Because that's yeah. so an antithetical to how I'm thinking. I, yeah. Originally, we thought, oh, they're the vectors, they're the super spreaders, but it turns <laughs> out to be not so much. Right. Why yeah, dogma that? for any other GI illness or respiratory illness, certainly daycares and schools are bad right. because children spread it. You know, we don't really know why. So we understand that from indirect evidence based on household contacts of children who have it, but the adults don't have it. When they look at those contacts, the attack rate is certainly much less. That means the spread from the children to the adults is much less, say, if an adult has it and brings it to the house. So that's indirect evidence saying, well, maybe the children don't spread it as less. We also understand, however, that children do seem to reproduce um, the virus in really the same amounts or concentrations in their upper respiratory tract as adults do or, or older kids. So we don't understand that really as well. That's just a few studies, obviously. But the other thing is, uh, you know, one of the physicians was talking about, well, maybe the children don't have the receptors that the older children have. So the receptor, the virus has to attach to something in your respiratory tract, and that's called the ACE2 receptor. Um, Influenza has a receptor as well. That's different. So they think, well, maybe the children don't have the same amount of receptors. They aren't as able to um, get infected or spread it as much because of that. So we really don't know. But based on that indirect evidence of lack of transmission to other household contacts, certainly in the early studies. Now, again, we're seeing differences now as we're seeing a lot of middle-aged and high school-aged kids getting the disease, especially in our community and possibly spreading it to the adults as well. So again, just early data. Um, we don't exactly have the answers. We're going to continue to look, certainly take guidance from CDC and look at all the other published reports, not only from the experience in, in other countries, because a lot of it is from other countries' experiences, but our experience here in the United States. So really what you're saying is, once again, a parent should be terrified of puberty. Is that really what we're thinking about here? <laughs> the teenagers, the meanagers, I don't know. Oh, watch <laughs> out for that. So, all right. You know, you were asked yesterday, are you sending your kids uh -huh. to school? And you yeah. said, yes. Yeah, I think we've always preceded or ended our comments with, if it's safe. But I think that there are definitely benefits. Again, we do need to keep the teachers, the administrators, the counselors, everybody safe. And we gave tips on how to do that. As you talked about, the spacing is important. You know, for the most part, if the teachers or the, uh, the administrators or other people who are interacting with the children, if you can maintain that distance for as long as possible, if you do have to interact with them, help them with reading, help them with problems, that interaction should probably be short, not the prolonged 10 minutes. And if both parties are wearing a mask, that's going to help as well. So um, at this point in time, um, I would like to send my kids to school if the schools do open and if it's otherwise safe, for sure. Well, and I think the key is, you know, we're, we, we were asked again, well, do you support Governor Kelly's plan? Do you not support Governor Kelly's yeah. plan? Where where do you guys land on that? And, you know, we, we are a health care provider. And to be clear, we're going to try and stay as best we can in our lanes around health care because that's what we do. And so we're gonna make recommendations to you to keep you and your family healthy and safe. That's our job, that's what we preach, and that's what we're gonna keep on saying. Yeah. So when we talk about schools reopening, what we have tried to say the entire time is the same message you gave us, Aaron. How do you do it safely? Mm -hmm. Then it's up to parents and the school districts to decide if they're gonna open up schools or not. That is not up for us to say, but we will say, this is how we stay safe. And the rules of infection control go wherever you are. Mm -hmm. They don't change just because you're in a school or you're in a hospital or you're at Chief Stadium or because you're at Allen Fieldhouse or because you're down at the bar or the grocery store. The rules of infection control are the same wherever you go. And I think to your point too, when, when the school conversation started two or three weeks ago, those infection dynamics in our community were much different than they, they are. are today. Mm -hmm. And we continue to have our evolving thought process as our data evolves. And, you know, Alan Greiner can speak to that, and you can speak to that, with especially specifically for Wyandotte County and the rates of infection and the demographics and all that. Because you guys are yeah. taking a little different tack than other counties because the county's different. Yeah, I, yeah that's right. I mean, uh, we've, we've got to be pretty agile, and things are changing quickly with, the, with this virus, as we've seen over the mm -hmm. past four or five months. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. So um, I, I think it was really interesting, the outcome of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, State Board of Education, you know, yeah. that, that vote yesterday, and, uh, and yeah. they said, you know, Governor Kelly, we're not into your <laughs> executive order. And so um, we, we, 
we're, we're thinking about that uh, outcome and, and what we might do in Wyandotte. Again, we'll have updates um, either tomorrow or Monday on sort of how we we decide on, on that as well. I have to shout out to our educators in, in Wyandotte and, and our superintendents. We've been actually working with them for a couple months already um, in, in just sort of anticipation of this. And, and what's the, what that has done, I think, for us, even though we're at a different point in the pandemic now, is that really solidified some of those relationships. And, you know, we've got each other on speed dial now. And so I, I feel like we've got really good relationships, which helps, well, it helps in a pinch. tremendously. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the mayor has done a great job in working He's with you. You guys awesome. and yeah. Yeah, Mayor Albie, Albie and yep. everyone. And I just have to say, you know, what, one of the things that happens with Wyandotte is I think it's actually a pretty underappreciated county. It's mm -hmm. got some pretty interesting things going on. It's mm -hmm. one of the most diverse counties in the United States. It sure is. And when you look at that and you say, okay, that means we're going to have a different set of challenges than, mm -hmm. say, Johnson County has. Mm -hmm. So there are economic challenges, but it's a diverse county, and you have to account for lots of cultures, lots of different types of behavior. So talk to us a little bit about that, because I think yeah. that's an undersold story about Wyandotte County. Yeah, I mean, I, I've really fallen in love with Wyandotte mm -hmm. County uh, again through through this pandemic. I mean, there is some silver lining. Um, really, I think um, the crux of what I want to talk about w with this question is the messaging. I mean, we are messaging uh, to many different um, sort of sub communities yes. that, that make up Wyandotte County, and so we've had to do that in in various languages. Um, we, we've had to do that in in various ways and different venues. You know, radio, television, in person, flyers. You know, et cetera, uh, and really actually personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth is extremely powerful in Wyandotte County. So knowing that, we've kept our community. Um, you know, liaisons and, and advisors extremely close. And I think one of the best things that, that Dr. Uh, Greiner and I and a few others were able to do early on in this pandemic is form that um, small uh, but really powerful health equity task force. And, and that has helped us, I think, to, um, you know, just continually learn about how should we be messaging. And, and frankly, um, you know, th all of these people on the task force, they have these tendrils, you know, out, out into the community. And, and they've been great partners, so we're, we're very grateful. I don't know if um, Alan uh, or Dr. Greiner, if you'd like to say more. <laughs> Other thoughts about that, about the diversity and some of the things you've, you've had to do, and including telling me, the, tell our, our listening audience some of the languages you've been, you've been mm -hmm. talking in. Yeah, and I, and I think it's been, you know, it's been a learning experience for us, but I think, you know, our health system is, has been embedded in the county for forever, right? And, and so I think we've all learned that tailoring that messaging is so important, um, empowering community members to be part of, of the work. You know, we've had a, a bunch of pastors involved who, who can spread the word uh, through the church communities. You know, we've had various nonprofits that serve different segments of the community involved, and, and they've all just been so powerful in, in helping us do what, what's required really being flexible and, and being able to meet people where they are. Yeah, I know there's a lot of Southeast Asian communities, Ukrainian, right. Russian. I mean, why not County is a fascinating conglomeration yeah. of different folks. So mm -hmm. next question, Jill. Robin wants to know, if you were teachers and you had to go into the school, what would your routine be? What are you going to wear? How often are you going to wash your hands? How would you protect yourself throughout the whole day? Well, I, love I know question. my first answer is wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask, and then wash your hands constantly and use as much alcohol and sanitizer <laughs> as you can. Um, I think that's the, the right answer. I mean, I, I think um, we can uh, certainly have you wear a face shield as well, which would, would be extra mm -hmm. uh, helpful and being being careful in that way. Um, if you want to have certain clothes, and, and I've talked with, with teachers and um, superintendents about this, if you want to wear certain clothes so that you can sort of at the end of the day put those aside, and uh, that's a, a good way to do it as well. Uh, you're yeah. the infection guy. <laughs> what do you no, think? No, I certainly agree. You know, we. Okay, so first is the mask, mm -hmm. and then we advocate Absolutely. for eye, eye protection, whether that's yeah. goggles from the hardware store or the, that's one of the um, 3D printed uh, face shields that just go on like a welder's mask. Obviously, every they're, day they're in my pocket. See there the side, be side panels. Oh, yes. Yes. Side panels on the side, a little covering at the top, a little at the bottom, and I look cool, right? I look cool. <laughs> uh, well, okay, maybe not cool. It's, it could be a step up. <laughs> and obviously, there can be problems with fogging. You know, walking through the hospital today when I was seeing patients early in the morning, I had fogging. I get used to it. It may be a little bit di more different in the, in the, um, the classroom setting. But also, I've seen people who put tape across the top of their mask to help reduce the fogging. 
So just starting there with the PPE, um, obviously the hand sanitizer, if most rooms can have alcohol gel if that's possible or if there's a sink to do frequent hand washing, avoiding touching your face. If you are teaching, you know, try and stay eight to 10 feet away from the students mm -hmm. when you're giving a lecture or talking about certain things. If you have to interact with them, help them read, help them comprehend, do the math problems. You can do that small interaction. If they can have a mask on, you can have a mask on. You probably aren't gonna be that long in prolonged cl close contact with them. Do that. As you start to do this and it, as you start to, if we do open schools, those things that are conscious will now become subconscious and become second nature to you. And that will then spill over into your regular everyday life. And right now that's kind of just have, what we have to do, but those are the tips that I would give if schools open and if we are back in the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, you know, we don't have a mask on today. We were talking about it beforehand, but we're seven feet apart. We measure it. We have the right kind of airflow in this room to get rid of our particles. And so we know. But as soon as that door opens up, we put our masks on because mm -hmm. the air handling changes and we start moving mm -hmm. around. And, and so it's something we do every day. And our guys in the control room behind us, they're sitting closer together. So they have to have masks on. They have a little different airflow in that room. So we do all the things we have to to, to, really, to really stay safe. So I think that's the key for teachers. To follow the rules of infection control. Wear a mask. I think wear goggles. I do. Yeah, I, I do. really I preach agree. the wear a goggle thing because yep. got your eyes are mucous membranes and you touch your eyes with your hands and mm -hmm. you rub your hands. So you just wear goggles, not glasses. Glasses mm -hmm. are not enough. That's right. Wear the goggles. And, For any and uh, yeah, if you have some ski goggles, wear those. And you'll think, well, I look funny. Well, you could be me and look funny every moment of every day. <laughs> or, uh, but, the, the, but the reality is that it does keep you safe. And what we're talking about, and we keep saying this, we think this is not going to be forever, right? You know, the United States has ordered 400 million doses of vaccine that will be available between October and December. That's a remarkable statement. They're already paying companies to develop it because they're so much confident that the vaccine is going to work. I'm, and I, you know, we've heard me say before, I'm Mr. Rose Colored Glasses. I think it's going to work. I think it's going to be here. I think it's going to help keep us safe. We don't know that yet, but there's a darn good chance mm -hmm. it's going to work. And I'm pretty, pretty confident that by January, yeah. we will have people at Arrowhead Stadium. And I think for the adults in the schools, they have meetings too, and we do, we touched on this yesterday. You know, no longer can you meet in, in a um, eight by ten room with four or five or six people. That's right. Find areas where you can meet mm -hmm. separated or do the Zoom. Make sure that the masks are on as well. So it starts with the adults as well because we don't, we especially don't want our teachers. We talked about substitute teacher shortages. We don't want our other administrators and our other uh, essential people in the schools to be ill either. So if you can do that and it starts with the adults and then can filter down to the classrooms as well. You know, here's what we know. We've been saying BKC and we can bend the curve and we did. And we can stay safe with school reopening following the guidance of people like Dr. Corvo and Dr. Greiner and we can be KC again and we can stay safe. But it takes a commitment to those rules of infection control. All right, another question. Shirley and a lot of people want some clarification around testing. Specifically, mm -hmm. uh, people that get repeated tests, yeah. are they are all of those tests at being counted as are they adding to the number? That's one of the things right. that they so have. There, there and they are, want to know yeah. your confidence in testing, too, because yeah. early on we didn't have a lot of confidence. We didn't. We have a lot more, but let, let's, no. let's, this, 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 we'll break That's this great. conversation down a little bit. Let's start with, are we comfortable with nasal swab testing, and uh, do we think it's, uh, it's accurate? I think it's really accurate, Aaron. I do, too, and that, I, I think that that's our gold standard at this point. Yeah, yes. it really is. Yeah. And, and Dana, yeah. the antibody testing has been a different question, which mm -hmm. we weren't sure was very helpful right. at the beginning, and it has to do with a lot of math and background prevalence. We don't want to yep. try and it, it will, we'll take forever in that part of the conversation. But the reality is it's gotten better. It's gotten better. So there are, at first, there were a lot of companies that put out antibody tests. Again, we know that there was a study with Mayo and ABC News that looked at some of those tests, and even when they tested saline for it, it was positive. Mm -hmm. um, so it shouldn't have been there. That's, so very, that's that probably not very accurate. Test. Bad test, bad test. We've had Dr. Plapp and Dr. Leisman here at the health system who validated and vetted several different companies, and we did land on one. And I think now there are maybe three or four that are really good to detect the antibodies. But what does that mean? Again, we said that if you are recovered, from COVID, that doesn't mean you can't wear a mask. If we detect antibodies in you, that's good. You can certainly donate plasma. Please donate convalescent plasma and other blood products to Community Blood Center. Um, but we don't know exactly what that immunity means. That means that you've seen the infection or the virus and that you have now some antibodies to it. 
Again, hopefully that will confer and give you some immunity if you are ever infected with it again, but we don't exactly know. But to answer the question, we know that our test here is, is pretty good and, and validated, and if it says that we didn't detect antibodies, then you probably did not have exposure to COVID, and if it did, then you probably actually did. So the sensitivity and specificity is pretty good. So Alan, how does the county handle people who have repeat negative testing? And, and I do have to say, I don't think there are that many people who have repeat negative testing. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get and eventually have to start paying for it. But, but how, how does the county handle people who try to get a lot of tests and they're always negative? So we've, re we've really tried to discourage that because we, we don't think it's, you know, it's super helpful in, in, in guiding decisions. You know, we I think we've all been pushing the idea that if you have any kind of symptoms of any illness, you should really stay home. I think that's a new normal, just like mask wearing is a new normal. It, we've got to get people to realize if you're, if you're showing any signs of illness, stay home. It doesn't matter if your test is negative three times or not, um, we, 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 you know, we worry that there are still some false negative tests that happen to people. And, and, and we just want to encourage, you know, one time testing is, is probably helpful for making decisions in terms of whether somebody needs to isolate or not, but, but multiple testing is something we, we, we don't feel like we have the resources to, to support that either at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So you might have and I should say too that um, so the test is very sensitive. It can pick up very small mm -hmm. copies of the virus if you have it. And this is again the nasopharyngeal swab, the PCR. And uh, we have really never been advocates of repeat testing if you are positive. Uh, that's if you have symptoms or not. And this is because we know from um, lots of published reports now that you can have positive tests for 60, 80, 90 days. So the positive test really doesn't help. In fact, the CDC now has updated their guidance suggesting that you don't need to have positive, uh, negative tests after you've had the illness, symptoms or positive tests. In fact, they're just going by symptoms at this point because we know that it's very difficult to get negative PCRs after a positive test or the illness from COVID-19. So um, those are new updated guidelines um, from the CDC. And, and again, they aren't really recommending repeat testing either. Dr. Hawkinson, I, I want to really just say that's absolutely how we feel in Wyandotte County. Yeah. We've had a lot of businesses request that people get a negative test, you mm -hmm. know, before coming back to, yeah. to work. So these are people who have tested positive previously and they come to us and they say, I'm desperate to get retested because my workplace says mm -hmm. I need a negative yeah. test to go back. If you all ever experience that, we want to know about it at the health department. We're happy to reach out to your, uh, the business that you work for and, and talk with them about that because our guidance is that, no, you really shouldn't be repeat tested. Just as we learned now, you know, you may test positive for a really long period of time, but you may not be still spreading the virus. And so we feel like it's probably safer to bring you back to work, mm -hmm. um, you know, even later on if you're asymptomatic and you've gotten better and, you know, you're feeling great, you know, before you've got a negative test. Well, yeah. and the truth is it after you've recovered from COVID-19 and again, 10 days and the negative yeah. temperature and all those things, yeah. you are probably likely less going less likely to give that to anybody else than someone else who's in there because you've already had the virus you're going to have some antibodies to it and the other people who you're working yeah. around are more likely to, get, to to spread it than you are yeah that's right so i think you just have to think about it. if you know the science you're not going to repeat and tests. so and far it's, yeah, it's fear that's driving that exactly to your point so far the best concrete evidence we have is in the animal model you know in a lot of infections and things we use animal models um, for SARS-CoV-2, it's the rhesus macaque model. Mm -hmm. And when they actually re-challenged rhesus macaques in two different studies, four weeks to six to eight weeks later, they found that actually the amount of virus that the monkeys produced was much less after an initial infection anyway. So basically we're going on the time basis, um, time from diagnosis or time from symptom. And it's really um, from the other small amounts of data that we have, um, they really aren't able to culture the virus, live or infectious virus, after about eight to 10 days after a human with illness. So. Jill, and the question. multiple tests, are they skewing the grand total? Oh, yeah, that was a good question. They, they could skew the grand total, but there aren't mm -hmm. that many people out there who are getting multiple tests kind of compared to the total number that are getting tests, and so I don't think it's gonna really skew anything. Right, I, I think we've tried very hard um, in Wyandotte County to clean up our data. We did have that concern as, as well. Um, and so, uh, again, we're really recommending that people not do that. When people come for testing, 
um, we're asking them, you know, have you been tested before? If mm -hmm. they have, you know, we're, we're, we're going off that first initial test. Yes. And in our hospital data, we, we can figure out because we, we yep. know the yep. unique identifiers, and so we don't report you know, repeated repeat testing. Well. Lola wants to know, should high schools and middle schools test all students and staff similar to what KU is doing? Mm -hmm. So let's clarify, though. KU is a little different story because KU represents a mass migration of 25,000 people into a community of 80 or 85,000 people. That is a completely different epidemiologic question than trying to reopen a school. So I, I think those are two different things, Aaron. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that that's um, something that we're, we're going to be doing in, in Wyandotte County. I, I don't know if there are other communities that are going to be mass I don't think testing. For, not for public schools. Again, it's yeah, not a mass migration. Of right. People. That, that's right. And, and I think the, the most important thing that, that we're looking for is, is people who are not feeling well. You know, teachers and, and students who, who don't feel good, you know, of course should be tested immediately. Uh, or those who are close contacts of those who, who are ill should be tested uh, a few days after that contact. And I would just say that the other thing that happens is we're bringing students from all over the country and, mm -hmm. and all over the world into KU, and that's just a fully different dynamic. And the other reason to do mass testing at KU is, is to help prevent a rapid surge of disease that overwhelms a healthcare community. So there are a lot of different factors that are going on at mm -hmm. KU that aren't true when we open up our elementary schools or the high schools now. Yeah. Having said that, there's still a challenge reopening high school and, and whether or not uh, young people will be good at a pandemic sure. or not. Traditionally, they're not, and so mm -hmm. that's a challenge, but that's not a testing challenge. That's a behavioral challenge, and those are different challenges. The other thing is that, of course, testing by PCR, um, as, as we've been talking about the, the traditional nasal swab test that we think is very sensitive, you know, mm -hmm. that is really a moment in, in time. Yeah. And, and so we know at that moment that somebody may be negative, but even the next day, you know, if they've been exposed, it's, it's just a, a moment in time. And so even just a few days later, somebody could be positive if there was a, a previous exposure. So it's complicated. Um. <laughs> it is complicated. Great question, though. Yeah. Leanne wants to know, should teachers go paperless? Oh, are we worried about paper? Are we worried about surfaces? <laughs> Not Dana? as much. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I don't think, certainly we're worried about maybe the non-porous or the, 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 the surfaces like mm -hmm. tabletops, desktops. Uh, but even then, it's much less the fomites, the inanimate objects, um, such as tabletops or door handles or paper, um, than it is being in close proximity with people. Certainly we know it, it can be spread that way, especially if you are touching those surfaces and then touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. But that's going to be much less. I don't think there needs to be um, a fear and anxiety about, uh, about paper tests or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And again, work on practicing good hand hygiene. Um, it may become, it may need to be a conscious effort and something you need to think about, but eventually it will become a subconscious effort and just second nature to you as well. Mm -hmm. One classroom apparently is going to, is considering creating bubbles within the classroom of six students in a pod. Interesting concept. Yeah, can we bubble students? And the problem, of huh. course, is they move in and out of different yeah. bubbles during the day. Well, yeah, I think you hit on it. Um, it, it is an interesting idea. Um, I think, as Dr. Greiner said um, a little bit earlier in our conversation, he hit on this idea of cohorting students. And so we're actually very uh, interested in, in, in cohorting and think that's a good idea. That means, you know, the same number of students is interacting with the same uh, teacher, and that's sort of the group for the semester or, or, or whatnot. So, um, I, I don't know if the, the six person uh, is, is going to be able to kind of stick together, but I would just say if those six people are in the cohort, then they probably shouldn't be interacting with the other Lots of other cohorts. Yeah, <laughs> the problem is they're moving out of that cohort when they go home and into the community. Yeah, right. So that, that cohort is for a very small amount of sure. time. It's a small amount of time and probably not a real cohort at that point. Right. You yeah. know, and even when we tell people when, you, when we're doing shelter in place, you're at home, figure out who's in your bubble. You have some control over yes. who's in your bubble. You have an agreed upon set of behaviors. So for us, it was um, my wife and I, our two kids, and their significant others. And we had the, they're the rules. We still have those rules. But what are we, how we do that so we can all be around each other. But if you go outside of that cohort consistently, eh, it's not really any longer a bubble or a cohort. But when I'm using the term cohort and bubble interchangeably there. But if, if you go outside the bubble, it's not really a bubble. And mm -hmm. that's what you have to think about. One last question. One last question. Let's do it. Fans and air purifiers, would they be helpful in a teacher's room? Okay. Air mm -hmm. purifiers and yeah. fans. That's a great one. It's hard, you know, because the, the fan dynamic, it's a funny one. 
It's how you handle airflow in an entire room, not just right in front yeah. of you. And the air purifiers generally are so small, they don't really, yeah. they're not going to handle a classroom very well. Yeah, and this is a difficult question. You know, I do have a friend that um, works with a company uh, with a product that's being put into a lot of locker rooms, a lot of um, professional and college locker rooms. You know, I think it can help um, as far as the air purifier. Um, you address the fan. Um, I think those are all adjuncts. Um, it's not going to be something that is going to save the day. It's not a panacea. The more important panacea, the more important things that will work is the distancing, the mask if possible. Um, we saw that from some of the investigations, um, particularly in one of the cruise ships, that really the HVAC systems were not implicated in spread of that disease. So um, I think it can help. It can be an adjunct as far as air purifiers. Um, but that's not going to be the main thing that is going to keep people safe. Yeah, don't bet your life on it. Let's right. put it that way. Alan, final thoughts from today. Well, I, I think we've all just got to, as I mentioned earlier, think about the, the new normals we're going to have for, for this this fall semester in schools. And, and I think in life in general, we're, we're going to be mask wearers and, and we're getting better at it. And, and we, again, we're hopeful that the data is, is showing up because then we've got proof that this this intervention has really helped us in, in our local setting and, and in this country. And, and so I think if we can work together on, on some of these new behavioral things uh, in the coming months, we can we can get through to, to when we do have the vaccine. I, I think that's what we we all need some of that hope and, and some things to look to look forward to as, as we go forward. Yeah, and I think that's really important. And and so thank you for being on the program today. And just to say, Dr. Kreiner, I think you just got a really big award here recently. Aren't you named some, you're, you're now a professor and it's endowed professorship. I mean, somebody just recognized all your work in Wyandotte County. Aaron, do you know more of those details? Oh, I think uh, Dr. Greiner was, uh, was or is he the Nason uh, endowed professor? I think that's that right. Oh, I think yeah. that's a big deal. And I just want to Dr. say congratulations Reiner. and thanks to all the great work yep. you've done in Wyandotte, yeah. Alan. We're proud that both <laughs> Alan and Aaron are faculty here at the University of Kansas Medical Center and part of our team of physicians here at the University of Kansas Health System. So that's a big deal. Yep. Final thoughts from today. Uh, I, I want to echo what um, Dr. Greiner said. Um, mask wearing is, is the way to go. And I think that, you know, just this week, we're seeing just a tiny bit of that, that turn of that we curve. We are. We're starting to and be it, KC. And if we can continue to see that turn, you know, we won't need to shut down, um, you know, other, other parts of our, our community. And we're trying really hard to keep things open. So please wear your masks. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think we all do this, medicine, health, because we care. We care about people. Um, as now the pandemic has put us into greater um, amounts of, of, of uh, public eye, we care about public health. You mm -hmm. and, and Alan Greiner definitely care about public health. As you touched on, we have to reach a lot of audiences. And the most powerful thing is word of mouth. And so what we are doing here is continuing to give the best quality evidence to keep you safe, to keep your family safe. Um, overall, we think it's working if we can see a bending of that curve and flattening, continuing to give our conscientious message. Um, hopefully, people and communities will continue to hear that and do the right thing, and we can get through this pandemic. There's a picture coming up of Brian wearing his mask in the car. He cares about you and I and, and all of us, and <laughs> so thanks, Brian. Kelly says the three-year-old Charlie is protecting his fox, and so they masked <laughs> the fox. I like that. Well done, Kelly. Just to be on the safe side, and Charlie, great modeling. And right here on our own master control unit, we referenced it just a little while ago. <laughs> Logan and Anthony are back there, and they're wearing their masks. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all your hard work. These guys are the unsung heroes behind the scenes of this whole program. Man, they so do funny. a great job. And, and uh, Anthony is a survivor of COVID-19. So I promise you, he is a firm believer in wearing that mask. You know, uh, tomorrow we're back answering just questions. It'll be great. Dana and I are on the hot seat. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, you know, folks, there's fear in their science. Some have been criticized for being wrong. I think Dr. Fauci has been criticized a little bit around that. And, mm -hmm. and it's kind of funny because I don't think Dr. Fauci is wrong. I think he just no. didn't know because we I didn't know. know. But, you know, we do know some things, right? We do know. And that's the science part of that. And the science is clear. Masks do not kill you. They don't cause you to inhale carbon dioxide. Masks are uncomfortable. There's no two ways about it. Yeah.
but masks save lives. They saved the life of patients in the operating room when the surgeons started wearing them and the rates of infections dropped dramatically back in the 30s and 40s. We started washing hands. Hard to think we didn't do that, but we started washing hands and the AIDS epidemic, we started wearing gloves. And you know what? People got better. They did better. Masks save lives. That's science. Fear can govern you, and fear can lead to some really bad choices. Just remember that there is proof in masks that has been earned not over just this pandemic, but over generations. Masks work. So stay with us. Stay with our program. Put that mask on. Keep yourself safe and keep everyone else around you safe, just like Kelly and Charlie and Brian and Anthony and Logan and the thousands of other people out there who are wearing their masks. We'll see you tomorrow.